Technically, it's time to start hacking 201, and we'll see how far we can get while chicken wars are going. Keep the chickens flying. Yeah. <laughs> this is All right. longer free-form continuation of hacking 101. <laughs> we are able to go into a bit more detail now since we're not constrained by an hour, although we may be distracted by flying chickens as we're giving our technical presentations. This is true, and... Uh, Certain conversations Blame will be that returned. man entirely, but this is a brilliant, brilliant idea, and I'm so glad you brought more of them back this year. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind that there will be probably some interesting conversations after midnight, after the cameras go off. And the stuff we don't stop. Stuff we don't want the Hilton or Dragon Con to necessarily see. So, I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. <laughs> We're passing around a couple of <laughs> collection containers. Um, this is for the midnight pizza run. There may or may not be some alcohol around here that may or may not be distributed as well. We've got to be a lot more low-key about that. You're not recording this part right now, are you? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plenty of non-alcoholic oh, The, the yeah. alcohol I does not that. exist. So... <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? The yellow ones are the worst, man. <laughs> Let's try this again. <laughs> now that. All right. That. How about we go ahead and get. He's <laughs> <laughs> dancing. Come on, go. <laughs> It'll be 11 until we get started. <laughs> <laughs> we barely started and you've already lost control. This reminds me of an old game on the Sega Genesis. Um, <laughs> oh. Booger Man, the Pick and Flick Adventure. <laughs> I remember renting that game from Blockbuster. I beat it in one night. Yeah, I was thinking Toad Jam and Earl. <laughs> Get us started. Through. All right. Welcome to Hacking 201. <laughs> Uh, show of hands, who's been to Hacking 201 before? All right, now put your hands down. Now put your hands back up. Who's not been to 201? Put your hands up. I didn't tell you put your hands down. <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> is that the piece of money or is this the piece of money? Yes. <laughs> so go ahead. They both are. All right, mm -hmm. I'm going to get this started, then I need to go ahead and start the pizza order, so yeah. All right, so uh, to get started, my name is Dustin Smith. I work for... What? The money extractor. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Dustin Smith. I'm Director of Infrastructure Architecture at a uh, petroleum uh, software company. And uh, that's all I will say, because I don't want my personal information spread out online. So uh, we can blame you in part for global warming? Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> I ran an IT company here in Atlanta for 10 years before moving up to uh, do government work, and then ended up getting a work-from-home job that I no longer have to work in a skip or drive 40 minutes each goddamn fucking way. All right. Nice. So um, that's pretty much my bio. Why don't we start with you? Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Bill Buddington, and I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation as a senior staff technologist there. Um, and uh, I uh, work um, on reverse engineering uh, various apps, um, apps slash malware, whatever they might be, for uh, <laughs> their privacy and security properties. Um, and uh, as a Star Trek fan, um, I am... I am not a, I am not a crook. Not a Kirk. <laughs> Kirk. <laughs> All right. Uh Johnny X. Um okay. Yeah, uh Johnny X or Drew Myers is my real super secret non-hacker name that's non-secret now because it's just been recorded. Um I helped start the EFF track. Many, many years ago, I think it was 99 when they first did a few preliminary panels to see if there was any interest in this stuff. Um, I took over the ailing space and science track in 2003, and we revived that, and we split it off into a separate space track and a science track and a skeptics track. Um, 
I've been causing trouble here at Dragon Con for about 25 years now. Uh, since I'm no longer a track director, I have a lot more free time to cause trouble. So maybe Dragon Con will either try to fix that problem and give me an official job again, or maybe they'll just ban me. I don't know. Um, I've worked for Google. I've worked for the federal government. Um, right now, I'm a student. Um, I'm in college, and surprisingly, I'm very good at it. I had no idea that would be a thing, but I'm currently triple majoring, hopefully, in computer science, data science, and astrophysics, and I'll be talking a bit later about my senior project, which combines all three of those. So, And apparently he can do roofs also. I can do what? Roofs. Roofs. Roofs? Roofing? Oh, roofing, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> roofing, yeah, roof, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, I, I, yeah, I had a very bi unexpectedly busy um, 48 hours right before the convention, found a giant hole in the roof, uh, on the roof of my mom's house, hidden by tree branches when part of the kitchen ceiling fell in. So I had to fix that before I came down here. That was fun. Yeah. For any of the Midwesterners on the uh, audience, um, it didn't understand that? That's, that's roughing. <laughs> Thanks for the translation. Okay. Good deal. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, Rubix uh, ex or Xavier. Uh, I've um, uh, here and been uh, growing up in the Atlanta scene. He was, uh, started hacking back in uh, the days of DVSing and um, CompuServe and Prodigy. Eventually got into that AOL thing, and then we got around to the Internet. And it's been a fun ride since then. I really took the IT path been doing like IT security, really kind of blue teaming, purple teaming, mm -hmm. had lots of great different experience, worked for, you know, large companies like IBM and, you know, done startups, uh, been in the financial space for, uh, for a while and it's been, uh, it's been a great ride. So I'll, I'll take the perspective of like, you know, information security and corporate, corporate side of things. So looking forward to it. Oh, nice. Hey everyone. My name is Rich Katz. This is, uh, my third year at Hacking 201. I am a, a lawyer by trade. I focus on cyber insurance claims, so cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, and I'm here to keep them out of most trouble, but usually I fail. So happy to be here. Saw it coming. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know what, uh, we, we're we going to have some presentations, stuff like that tonight, but why don't we talk about a little bit about uh, what's been going on in the news as far as cybersecurity. <laughs> I heard of CrowdStrike. Oh, yeah, <laughs> CrowdStrike. Someone had a really, really bad day that day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of people had a really, really... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was I was in, in the thick of it from yeah from two a.m. on. It was a it was a fun night. Uh, it tested a lot of our systems to be able to how resilient you can do things. You know, uh, the banking infrastructure loves to do things with virtual machines, and that virtual infrastructure makes it really easy to fix things like the cross strike problem, where you have to get into the BIOS uh, and, and or rewrite a file uh, across the entire infrastructure. So it was a uh, it was a it was a great uh, you know testament to some of our uh, you know technology choices, especially when you look at companies like Delta who took like weeks to, to recover. So it was uh, you know, I know it's gonna be interesting to see the liability things because because that that makes uh, well you're right it it, in, it influences choices that that, that gets made. Is, is there what oh, what is it? Close, close. So yeah, I mean, I I could talk about that quite a bit. So what was interesting about the CrowdStrike term from a cyber insurance perspective is that it was a system failure, right? So typically, cyber insurance will cover multiple things, but from the tech space, it's a security failure or a system failure. So the coverages available to a policyholder for a security failure are very broad. It includes like <laughs> response services, PFIR. Um, notification if any data has been accessed, um, as well as you know reputational harm coverage, business interruption coverage, what we call extra expense coverage, which is used to defray potential business interruption loss. However, a system failure coverage typically only covers business interruption loss and extra expense. So what is that? That's like a pure revenue play, right? But if you look at some of the primary policies for these airlines, which I guess, unfortunately, I have some very direct access to they have a lot of like 
not exclusionary language, but narrowing language. For instance, most of them won't pay for third party claims arising out of a system failure. I think you all can imagine that there might be some claims by people against Delta Frontier United for the facts that they couldn't travel or get on their planes. Well, that's not insurable under some of these policies. So long story short, there is some coverage available, but it's not nearly as much coverage as would be available for like a security failure. Yes, I did. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear me. So for those that didn't hear me, my name is Rich Gatz. I'm an attorney and I'm the head of cyber claims for Arch Insurance and uh, work with cybersecurity and data privacy claims. All right, so we also have uh, the, the, the mic of, of greenness uh, here in the room. And so, uh, you know, this is a very interactive night as we go through and anybody wants to ask questions or follow ups, you know, please come up to the mic. We are recording the, the first part of this tonight uh, and that goes until midnight. And then the, uh, the, the, the topics might change after that. Yeah, historically what we did was, and um, I'm not allowed to do this anymore, unfortunately, we would bring in about five, $600 worth of beer and uh, like the good stuff and uh, some hard liquor and some wine and just kind of spread it out all over the table here. And the way the panel used to go was you ask a good question, you get a good drink of your choice. Wow. Cool. That was very inventive. It's like a family. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> They're like singing. Oh no, we got plenty more. We got like boxes of them. Okay, so I, I, where was I? Uh, we're also, yeah, we're okay. also recording an epic. It's going to be. It's going to be. Yeah. So it used to have. Um, you know, you ask a good question, you get a, a good uh, beer or shot or you know, drink of your choice. Allegedly. And, um, <laughs> uh, ele yeah. Well, we, we did try to get good stuff. You know, lots of Guinness. Um, 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 um. We also had a 40 ouncer of the cheapest crap we could find, and whoever asked the bozo question got served that overhand. <laughs> and I will say the first time, the first time we did that, um, we implemented ask a good question. You know, you get a beer, and um, we kind of got hacked on that because the very first question was this 15, 16 year old kid who came up to the microphone and said, "Yeah, can I have a beer?" and um, um, we kind of looked at his dad, and his dad said, yeah, sure, he's got to learn sometime. So uh, we applauded his ingenuity, but we said, from now on, that only works once a year. So we went on from that. Um, but obviously, we don't have all the, the booze that we can give you to make you be our friends, at least for tonight. So uh, Dustin, how, how do we start things off now? It has to be funny. No pressure. <laughs> but up, 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 up. Do we ah. do we agree? Okay, all right, okay. Bravo, bravo. All right, so um, come up to the the microphone, I guess. There, try not to get slapped in the face when that thing inevitably lets uh, lets loose there, and ask your questions, and we'll go from there. And um, if we don't know, uh, but someone out there in the audience does, feel free. It's all about the exchange of information. And if you don't know the answer to a question, but you can bullshit really convincingly, that'll work too. <laughs> I think the rate of preventing pregnancy would be st quite significantly lower than a, a normal condom. Yeah. So I just fast this 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 panel has gone. I just want to say that. If you are interested in cybersecurity, you know you're toying with the idea that it was actually this panel nine years ago that opened up doors for me into cybersecurity and IT. I'm now a machine learning engineer. So, you know, I just want to say that take this panel, the people here, the resources that they have in your questions, and really dive deep because there are a lot of people in this room that can really open up a lot of doors for you. And I think that this panel. Had I not been here nine years ago when Sorok was up there, 
I would not be where I'm at in life today. So I just want to say, first off, that this is a great resource to really break into security, break into tech, break into all these things that is just so hard for so many people to do. And that's all I got to say right now. Holy shit, we did some good. I, wow. Go us. Go nice. all of us. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sorry for coming back to this, but on the uh, crowd uh, CrowdStrike fiasco, um, what methods or directions were used in order to determine if it was malicious or just incompetence that caused the accident when it first happened? There was no kind of reports of malicious uh, activity in the, in the first, like, the, as a cause of the crowd strike outage um there was malicious activity you know in the aftermath for instance um you know those that would claim to be uh crowd strike uh, uh you know like a, a incident mitigation uh engineers that would then try to um claim that they were actually with crowd strike and <laughs> and you know cause um, uh, it's like an efficient attempt to cause some kind of um, anachronic credential ceiling. Um, but there, I don't, I haven't seen uh, much reporting in terms of like, it's pretty clear in the line of events that we have since discovered that it was a error in the software that was deployed um and the way in which um that was uh you know not for instance <laughs> deployed to a small number of uh of uh systems first and some of these mitigations that they've implemented which include you know um uh kind of small deployment before full-scale deployment of an update would mitigate instances of just the kind of uh, full-scale shutdown that we saw on, now what was it, um, what was the day, uh, June 24th, forget. wasn't it? Was 19th it the, of July. Yeah. 19th, 19th of July, July, that's right, yeah. And so, so I think that like um, there isn't any kind of uh, any like anyone serious saying that it was a a attack, um, but I think that it you know it was a, a series of cascading failures. Yeah, I I'd, I'd agree with that as someone intimately familiar with this from various perspectives that I, I can't go into because of NDAs. Um, it was not malicious. This was a configuration error. Um, I think CrowdStrike has done a really good job of being very open in their communications to the public. They did an after action report that's available on their website for anyone to read that is very thorough. Um, I think that when you look at the response by the cybersecurity industry to this, I think anyone with any kind of actual skin in the game is basically saying, this was a mistake, this could happen to anyone. Um, it just happened to CrowdStrike. You know, like the, the data file that was deployed was supposed to update threat intel, right? It was on their Falcon sensor on individual endpoints that rendered those individual endpoints essentially quasi bricked, right? Like blue screen of death. So there was kind of a, a natural inability to leverage this for a malicious activity because the, the systems were were bricked, right? So, um, you know, we're not seeing anything. I know that there was some conjecture initially of CrowdStrike. How did your QC like not find this? Um, and I saw a couple of security researchers saying that they, maybe there was a threat actor that replaced the data file with bunk information that caused this, but that just hasn't been demonstrated at all. I think this was a a, a massive QC failure. Um, that they're going to remedy, <laughs> they'll be fine going forward. It must have been typically constant for a day. Right. And so they don't do a lot of you know, They did sin is to finally choose to only deploy to a ring of machines and then right. out. And, yeah. 
yeah, it was it was kind of like the perfect storm. Um, and you know, I think in all industries, especially cybersecurity, I think <laughs> complacency is is a real issue. Not to say CrowdStrike was complacent, but just because things have worked for you going forward doesn't mean that you need to continue to do that and not put things into place to, to protect yourself and your customers. What are your thoughts on the follow up to the fact that Microsoft initially did not want any of those applications software to have that amount of access? The red ones work better, probably. I mean, that, that's like a kind of a fair uh assessment for microsoft to make but if you're developing anti-virus or endpoint in this case security uh applications then <laughs> it's necessary to have some level of uh, some low level of access in order to basically catch the <laughs> mal malware before it is able to um gain a persistence within a system and i think that if you're you know a any level of reliable uh endpoint security software then you need to have some kind of low level access if you know microsoft wanted to develop some kind of a system that would provide similar uh functionality then you know and and to some extent, they do with uh, Microsoft Security Basics, but not in, to the level of uh, endpoint security that you know maybe enterprise customers need. Then um, that would have been uh, an alternative that would uh, only Microsoft would kind of be able to provide. But I feel like this is a situation where industry and third parties have stepped in to fill that gap. How do you feel about EP? <laughs> Good one. I, I, don't, I don't know enough to, about the issue to, to come. And we blame the European Union. If it wasn't them, <laughs> Microsoft wouldn't have opened up the kernel in the first place. No, I, 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 the one comment I wanted to make is is that part of the part of the blame is on the, on the industry. This this. This situation that we've you know put ourselves in is is pretty much common. You know, it, each vendor kind of says, "Hey, this is your this is what we're choices we're giving you," and and we didn't demand more. You know, we just said, "Okay, all right, you know, we'll, we'll not have the ability to you know stage this update you know in our lower environment to push out to prod you know later." You know, we, that's that's been a you know a a, a thing that, that we didn't demand a bit enough and and push on our vendors to be able to say we you know we need this so 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 I, I put part of the blame on the industry to be able to stand up and say hey we need to do better when we're securing our systems. And I would add too, really quick, like don't forget that Microsoft Azure had a major outage literally hours before the CrowdStrike outage, which likely made the CrowdStrike outage much, much worse. In fact, I think there's been some credible arguments saying that a lot of the, the airline issues were primarily an Azure, like the, the Azure central data, data point or database system went down was a result of that um, versus CrowdStrike. So Sorry, something that we're doing from an insurance perspective is trying to understand <laughs> what damages come from what. All right. So, yeah, let's, I, I, I can yeah, hear. Let's get, let's get to the mic. <clears throat> so if anybody's looking for more information, the CrowdStrike issue, like he said, he mentioned on it, there is a hub, uh, a general hub you can go to look for the CrowdStrike incident 219 um, channel file um, issue that we had. And you can go through it. They cover everything. There's the president's um, release on it. They go in full depth, including some of the code um, that you can actually go through and see the channel functions that were affected. Um, actually, I was one of those people Two affected by this. So, uh, yeah, don't want to say anything else on it, but the, uh, everything about it is out there to go take a look at. And, uh, like I said, the issue has been resolved. And yeah, Microsoft Azure uh, outage uh, also kind of added to confusion of the moment because um, it took place in very close proximity, uh, like oh, like shortly after midnight on that day, uh, June nineteenth, um, and they were reporting on these outages and on the outages that were caused by them at the same time as CrowdStrike was 
uh, experiencing outages of their own. And they kind of just like add to this uh, barrage of mixed messaging that uh, made it very hard to figure out what was going on. There actually was a similar outage in the 90s with McAfee. They sent out a, a signature update that decided that it was going to start to quarantine files within the system 32 directory. Now, guess who the CEO of McAfee was at that time? <laughs> and guess what company he's the CEO of now? Ding, 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 ding. And, and, and the issue hit McAfee so bad as a company, that's why they sold out to Intel. So it actually destroyed that, 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 in, that actually killed the company. So let the, just think about that. Everybody said, ooh, cross strike stocks cheap. I'm gonna buy some. Like, just know, McAfee did not recover. Is uh, are they recovering? Yeah, I mean, they're they're at ninety nine point nine nine percent uptime. Like, they're completely normal as to what they were before the incident. And in terms of stock prices, uh, they've recovered pretty well. Like, you would expect that the largest IT outage in history would cause uh, the stock prices of the company responsible to to plummet, but they've actually kind of, you know, uh, so they haven't <laughs> fully recovered, but, um, they're doing pretty well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that something that they have going for them is CrowdStrike is primarily a large enterprise service provider. So they're not dealing with like the SME market. Right. And so they're working with Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies. So if you can think about the cost to replace an EDR, MDR system for a 10,000 endpoint network plus, okay, like this is not something where you can just walk in one day and the CISO is going to be like, oh, they had a system failure, F them, we're going, we're using Sentinel-1 or Carbon Black. Like you just can't do that, right? So I don't see a long-term impact to their revenue revenue i do know that they had a lot of business opportunities that they were currently pitching that might be going elsewhere um but i think generally in my opinion i don't think that this is going to be a, a material impact to them going forward i don't think that's going to work uh, he just looks very <laughs> unhappy he just looks very very unhappy <laughs> Yeah, next yeah, question. Yeah, sure. It's a, a little bit of a context switch, but so at work, we have uh, occasionally we'll have some red teams come in and just, hey, what can you get into? What can you find? And then our C-suite obviously sees the value in that and they throw money at it. But then when they break in and they eventually get domain admin within three seconds, they do everything they can to hide it from all of the engineers and you can't know how they did it. <laughs> Okay, cool. That's the reaction I was expecting. So should, how do I educate my C-suite that, hey, we should probably know how they did that so that we can fix that? Or am I completely off base there? Well, I mean, I would say from a legal perspective, um, with some of the SEC actions against CISOs, um, there's a very real risk that if you're an upper level management of ISIT for a large company, and you're not made aware of those things and you're making business decisions based upon that, you could actually have a personal liability issue. So, um, you know, like how they sued like Uber's CISO and like, I mean, th there was some things there. I mean, the, the dude basically like hidden lied, but you know, generally I think if, if you're a CISO and you are an officer and executive of the company, generally under principles of directors and officers law, you are personally liable for what you do. Now, generally, companies will indemnify you, but if you're making a business decision with not all the information, there's some actual liability that could, you know, respond to that. Oh, so as part of the contract that they have with the red team, they, they're sitting somebody on kind of security or IT says, and they just report what was passed because it doesn't make sense in red teaming and then not have a way to fix the issue. So you can already fix it, you know what they did. Yeah, I totally agree. The problem that I run into at work is like all of our cybersecurity people, they don't they don't have like computer science degrees or really know how computers work. And so they they heard of Metasploit once like five years ago and they went, oh, oh, my God, that was good. That was good. 
and just like I try to educate them on, hey, this is this is LS and Linux. This is how you find files, guys. Oh no, you're supposed to protect all of us. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think you need to have buy-in. Unfortunately, in my line of work, oftentimes you don't have buy-in until after a breach. <laughs> nice. Hi. It's not weird that it happened. It's weird that it happened twice, <laughs> um, almost three times. So yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, what honestly, like, I would talk to your leadership and just say, hey, you know, we want to do what's best here. Like, is there a rationale or reason you're not sharing this information with us? Um, because I don't know how you would ex be expected to fix something if you don't know about it, right? Maybe you can like outline the risk of like not fix, not knowing how to fix it, and if something happens, what it might cost the company or my own company. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've definitely tried that angle, but I'm, just, I'm apparently not very good at communicating the hey, you like having billions of dollars, right? Oh, cool. I guess not. <laughs> Very good yeah, there, there's there's a couple of, you know fairly good resources out there on on like uh, kind of like CISO level resources how how to communicate to the board you know there's a couple of good communities uh, you know reach reach out to um, you know yeah in Atlanta you know there's there's a you know a couple of, of, of circles where they're vendor led but you know we all go out to dinner and and uh, <laughs> here 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 with this pitch and that pitch but we we all you really just hang out together right? and and you get to get the kind of talk to say, all right, let's get into this. Give me some real advice and, and get get some mentorship and that will help you yeah, figure out a lot. What what weird language will get me my, you know, me and my money to get my get get my shit done. Yeah, learning how to talk up is very much a skill. It is. <laughs> and I get it, because and that's one of the biggest challenges by having a, a technical background as a CISO. <laughs> it's adrenaline led speaking. I love it. It's like, yeah, let's get on. I've never thought about the legal angle of, hey, you might be personally like, yeah, hey, you, you, guy, you, you, I would hey, John Moneybag. How do, as a as a person who's only uh, elegant in bird law, how do I? Uh... <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, again, I think that's something that you'd want to escalate in your chain. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to Fair. communicate with your business, but um, there is a real risk as a CISO that if you are ignoring cybersecurity based issues, and you fail to act on them, and there is a large-scale breach, you are potentially opening yourself up to personal liability. And, you know, that is just how it is. And so if the company decides not to indemnify you, you know, there's Good. some potential issues there. Good luck, have fun in court. Right. I mean, they usually will because they obviously don't want someone to just, like, go rogue. But, I mean, I, again, I think after Uber and then after a, a bunch of other things, I mean, the SEC is very focused on cybersecurity disclosures. So our, if you're a publicly traded company and you do have these issues, you have to file on 8K within a reasonable period of time. And if you don't do so, you're potentially liable to the SEC for fines and penalties. Oh, cool. Thank you for the advice. I appreciate it. Thank you. So the trust model is responsible for 90% of what uh, hackers do, right? You, you trust a system to do something the way it's expected to do, or you trust a certificate, or you trust that some company will fulfill their obligation, and it doesn't, and that's how, that's how the hackers and uh, other types of exploiters uh, gain access to systems. Um, but on the other hand, you have to have trust in connected systems, or the systems don't talk to each other. How, uh, from uh, almost a blue team's per perspective, do you draw that line between how do we trust one software to do what it's supposed to do in the way we expect it to do it, and two, how do we uh, keep that trust to the minimum level so we can actually have secure systems? CrowdStrike being the obvious example here, we it underpins every bit of modern architecture, and that's why it had such a large impact. Less trust, less impact. Yeah, I, I think that's one from a GRC perspective. Um, the, the answer is, is is control, right? Is you look at your system as you know from a systems perspective, and you see it, you know a series of of, of you know systems that the, you can put controls on to say this is what I expect at each of these control points, and then you measure those control points, and that's how you you, you understand what's baseline and what's not. So that that that's the, you know that's where how we got into things like WAFs and and you know signature based you know detection on on uh, the network and all of that is is exactly that and applying that same logic is 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 information security just applied to a specific business model 
And that's what, you know, in, in the financial world, that's, that's a big thing, right? We, you know, fraud detection and all these control on every little <laughs> aspect of the system. Uh, you know, so, th so there, is, there is a systematic way to address it. It costs a lot of money. You know, only big, big companies can go into that level of abstraction, but that's, that, that there, is, there is a fact. Okay, so I think of also the issue of trust as not only an issue of who you trust, but the processes that you trust, right? Um, the LibXZ Utils uh, kind of uh, backdoor was a big issue uh, here in that you had a system that was compromised by some unknown actor um, and it was compromised for a very short period of time uh, that only affected rolling releases and not stable releases of a lot of the operating systems that we might rely on. So for instance, like Debian stable or like any, if you were like running any staged uh, uh, Linux OS, then you wouldn't have been affected. But uh, if you were running some rolling OS, um, then you would have been. And on a yeah Arch or or uh, Kali or whatever, um, and so I only really use the backtrack. Backtrack is <laughs> old I, I, school. I nice, um, but yeah, 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 I learned hacking on backtrack. Um, so uh, I feel like I'm w one of the reasons. One of the reasons why uh, we trust the processes that are Whoa. in Debian, for instance, is that they are vetted. They take a while to make it into <laughs> the stable main line releases. And so we kind of like, you know, trust that the process will catch uh, something fishy going on in the meantime, be before it hits kind of some stable main line release. So we trust the Debian developers and, and the, the ones that sign packages to do their job and not sign anything malicious. They also trust the process to kind of catch the fishy shit that goes on before it will hit some kind of mainline release, right? Um, which is which is what happened in the case of lib uh, uh, XEU tills in, uh, is that a um, developer of um, <laughs> a developer of uh of uh not um uh mysql but um but uh, uh a postgres a, a postgres developer was doing uh benchmarking on Whoa. a postgres developer was doing benchmarking on like uh uh why why is this like you know particular process taking way longer than i expected it to take oh wow what is it doing here and so there was kind of like this this uh you know um level of precaution that is taken before it deploys that fucking everyone right um and and i think the that's multi shots kind of a, don't work a really like pr prudent way to to develop software and release it is that like okay if it is like something pressing and really needs to the fix it really needs to be pushed right now then do that um but if it is a like feature release that uh, that doesn't need to be pushed out right now. Then uh, that then then take some. It's a worm. Fucking jurisprudence, right? No, it's 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 a great concept, and, and we actually talk about that in the corporate world. Is you know how fast do we want to change? You know, it is you you don't really have to be the Sorry. first, and and you've got to talk about that as a business and understand where you want to be on on that curve of uh, splitting. You know. <laughs> on the edge or uh you know take a little less risk all right okay for any of the panelists if we are distracting you too much you can tell us to fucking stop okay <laughs> go ahead may i do it i would like to thank the electronic frontiers foundation forms electronic Frontier Foundation forums at DragonCon and all of the professionalism of you up there in the midst of this total chaos. It is immaculate how you just kept on going with it like a pro. You guys are the best. 
Yeah, it's amazing. This is total chaos. It's like it won't be any more chaos. This is like a more chaos. day at work. Let's have some more chaos. My uh, level of sobriety and work? chickens not standing. Okay, but my anyone? But I do have a question. Yeah. I, I know, but I think this is an ADHD test. This is exactly <laughs> what I've been. And I'm doing my ADHD quite well. Thank you. Um, my question is, where the hell do we buy these? <laughs> <laughs> and what are they called? Your chicken dealer is right there. Thank you very much <laughs> for a great show. Chicken right here. <laughs> oh, no. They're also known as sling chickens, slingshot chickens. Yeah, Amazon. <laughs> so quickly, my my it's not a well, it's kind of a question. So I posted, I posted something on the Bluetooth advertisement channel. You seeing my? Footage. Sorry, can you speak a little? I, I know that mess, but like, uh, can you speak a little clearer? Uh, sure. I can't really hear you very well. So I posted something on my um on your on everybody's. Bluetooth advertisement packet using my Flipper Zero. Uh, as a reminder of something I'm very interested in, uh, my question is, have you read it? That's it. How, how, the question is what? Have you read it? Have you read the advertisement packet in the Bluetooth that I'm transmitting using my Flipper Zero? No, I, 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 I so wanted to bring my Flipper and, and be able to play with that, you know. Completely forgot it at home, so we could, we could have gotten into that. There's a flippers just this sitting over here. Oh, look at that. Is this yeah. mine? Who's? Da 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 da. Somebody was wiggling in their seats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. I I do. I I I'm completely cheating through my butt plug. Yeah, that's a great. That's how I'm able to, to dodge. Can you guys speak to where you are in your various industries about the lack of or apparent lack of naming and shaming uh, in specific instances of you know known hacking, identified hacking, tools, resource, you know overseas groups, domestic groups, whatever it is, right? Networks get attacked all the time, but I feel like every once in a while the federal government's like it's this little branch of Russia or this little branch of China, but you don't see a lot of attribution across the commercial sector uh, and kind of what the logic is in doing that and, and kind of where your industries well, are. Well, I mean, with the exception of NCC Group, right? Like, I think NCC Group has been the one instance of where this has been really called out, and uh, you know, uh, ha has had some real, um, I mean, um, I guess, executive decision-making power leveled against it, and so, like, I think that. There are other instances of a lot more groups, you know, industry spyware manufacturers that are developing malicious tools that are used against activists and uh, human rights defenders worldwide, yeah. where um, and they're not just the obvious example of Pegasus. And Pegasus has kind of had some level of blowback. Uh, and and um you know i think that that should come more you know that should have be more more uh frequent but we we're not yet seeing that i think that that's kind of, kind of coming though so I, I i would say the primary reason is that corporations and companies don't want to disclose the hacks publicly they'll disclose information such as we've had a data breach or there's been authorized access to your information but um a lot of companies will work with NDAs with both their insurance providers, with their vendors, under under the auspices of legal counsel. And so <clears throat> very rarely will you actually see a public disclosure of like a fairly large event. Or if you do, it's, you know, they don't really kind of disclose it. Um, one of the bigger ones was uh, one which I was actually intimately involved in, but won't disclose who, but there's a security research that, that said okay well the dark side ransomware variant got paid a 75 million dollar ransom okay and they know that by tracking certain things on the dark web and maybe even um tracking certain bitcoin wallets and things like that um that entity did not want to publish the scope of that breach right and so um we're fa we're basically seeing a lack of reporting 
and we're seeing this on the law enforcement side as well. The FBI is consistently urging companies to file an IC3.gov report when they have been hacked or if there has been something. Um, and frankly, they're not getting the uptick on uptake on it that they would like to. So I think right now companies are very worried about third party risk, class action risk, as well as um, making sure that they don't scare their customers and clients. So an IC3.gov report, so IC3.gov is literally a website that the FBI runs where you can make a report in regards to electronic or internet-based crime. So if you have a wire fraud or identity theft or a ransomware event, you can file a complaint with the FBI and that will be set to an FBI field office. Correct. However, um, I remember a couple years ago, I was on a they call it an exchange between it was an exchange between private company private industry and fincen department of treasury fbi secret service and this was towards the end of the year and they said that they had like a hundred plus ic3.gov reports of ransomware and like a hundred plus and that was systemic throughout the u.s yeah i was like <laughs> i've handled a hundred ransomware claims over this period right so i think to your question, we're not seeing, we need to see more reporting and we also need to see kind of, I, I do agree that we need more disclosure, but the potential, potential impact on a private or even public company is material enough to where they don't want to publicly disclose that information. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a contractual relationship between two interested parties. And so in, in my space, we get NDAs from insurance brokers and policyholders who just, I mean, as an insurance company handling that claim, I'm not gonna go, oh, hey, uh, Dragon Con, let's talk about this individual that paid this large ransom, you know, but they wanna protect themselves. If anything, I personally think the FDAs are a little bit performative uh, because there's kind of relationships that basically necessitate that you don't share this information, um, but you know, there's been a massive uptick in third party data privacy class action litigation um, due to some kind of novel case holdings in California and elsewhere. So companies really want to keep this stuff under the vest unless they have to absolutely notify individuals because even just publishing that there's been a breach will lead to class action litigation. And the jurisprudence for data privacy litigation is very kind of chaotic at this moment, depending upon where the suit is filed. So even though you might have a very strong case against liability, you're still potentially going to spend high six, low seven figures just defending the case. Are you seeing differentiation in that, whether the attack comes from a non-state or state actor, or if there become requirements as you guys have kind of worked across the government sector where you bump into the government being required to report if you believe it's a state actor versus being a non-state actor? So the, the, a lot of the reporting requirements don't really aren't really based upon who the threat actor is. It's like the industry that you work in. Like if you're a DOD contractor, they have reporting requirements. There's some states with municipalities and other things that have reporting requirements. Um, you know, but I mean, it's very hard. I mean, we have a good idea who the state threat actors are, but it's very, very hard to identify them like with certainty. Yeah. And so you have a lot of plausible deniability. Now from the cyber insurance context, this is interesting because a lot of policies have a war exclusion, right? And, but the thing is, is how do you determine if is something's an act of war or not, right? So. I appreciate that insight. Yeah, hearing it from the, the legal side of things and not the side we normally hear. But take anybody else's input on that. If what was the original question? <laughs> I'm sorry, there were too many chickens flying around. So we're a little distracted. But just if it was uh, naming and shaming uh, the uh, malevolent actors that you guys have been dealing with, and, and obviously there's a lot of reasons not to do that, but a lot of reasons too, and, and kind of where that has bubbled to the surface, or at least what do you guys, you know, you hear a different thing at a bar that you would actually report, but you all know from your friends that you're seeing. Specific country, specific actor, specific well, whatever. It's, it's it's interesting. I've had a, you know specific you know uh, situation recently where you know looking at you know an actor and being able to kind of describe you know this. Good day. <laughs> I'm hitting my water. 
<clears throat> so this threat actor uh, was, you know, is is who we identified. But if you wanted to then take it to the next step and you know arrest people and say that this person's part of that group, that started happening. And then we were able to, and, and so it, and it was one of these where you know, you know, it's not where we said we have enough information. You know, I, I knew the level of information. You know, you couldn't sit there and say it was this person yeah. uh, or that person over there on that side of the world. It was just this is the pattern of behavior that we saw that fits this description. And so it's kind of loose leaf correlation. And and then once it goes to law, that is you know beyond most industry knowledge. Is now you're into law, uh, you know, criminal law, and that's 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 really outside outside of my scope. Thanks, guys. So my question here boils down to, you know, right now I'm in the consulting space, public sector. Um, I uh, got my rise in cloud engineer, cloud security, DevSecOps. Uh, but, you know, kind of in my consultancy phase, one of the things that I'm really seeing is this, you know, overall both public sector and private sector fear of AI tooling and its capabilities, putting a limitation on it. And, you know, they're limited things like AI co-pilot. They are, you know, limiting their staff's ability to innovate. And one of the things that I am particularly noticing is the rise of these very intricate, almost overnight attacks of scripts, of trojans, of worms, the things that are being sent into our data pipelines, you know, is a binary executable of some type. Um, and beforehand, I would never see these type of things. And I really have to boil it down to, you know, we have bad actors out there that are using tools like AI LLMs, training them to fine tune them and write these very elaborate, simple scripts that, you know, normal manpower is not keeping up with. Um, do you have any thoughts, feedback on, you know, how we can help, you know, our stakeholders understand that, you know, AI itself should not be feared. I understand that there is a reluctance to adopt AI tooling, but it is this overall stance of just AI is bad all in general that is actually going to put them at an uneven, how do you say, odds in a year or two from now for the, I'm going to say, the degree of evolution that bad actors can adapt to systems that, you know, within their current life cycle processes take three to five years to complete. Um, that That's really kind of professionally where I would really love some feedback at. But they are still using these prompts to develop very robust tasks based on the limitations. I mean, there's literally something called hack GPT, yeah. right? And and so we're we're seeing it a lot in um the uh like social engineering space where I actually had a claim that came in, it cost five million dollars, where they basically had multiple individuals on a Zoom call, okay, that they used pictures from LinkedIn to mimic executive officers of a deep company fakes. deep fakes but they basically used machine learning ai because ai is everything now right um to basically in real time act like other individuals to have five million dollars transferred to a random bank account sure. <laughs> so i mean it, it is a very very big issue but i guess my content my, my my response to that is and i've had some cybersecurity professionals disagree with me on this is as defenders, we have to be perfect, right? Whereas as attackers, they just need to get lucky. And so I think this is just a natural escalation in like the cold war between like threat actors and non-threat actors. And so we're just gonna have to learn to deal with it. I like that analogy. I think that was a good analogy. Thank you. <laughs> Going back to um, the beginning <laughs> and uh, bringing up like uh, current current events. So going back to I guess I guess it was April or February April when they had the initial hack that they found like the data broker and all that information it was on for sale and then a couple of weeks ago it was now available for free. <clears throat> so what are your thoughts on the fact that 
that database and a lot of those data brokers, a lot of that information is not actually 100% accurate. Now, yes, there's social security numbers and all this other stuff, but it doesn't actually match the people <laughs> that it goes with. So a lot of people look at the data and we're like, well, it's not me, even though technically, you know, some of that information is correct. And if somebody took that database and compared it to other databases, they could probably correlate all that information even better. And so there's not a lot out there that you can do to protect your information, and especially when it comes to these days when everything is already out there. I mean, you just have to assume that your information is out there. And so what do you think people should do to protect themselves? Yeah. So like, you know, when you're talking about um, the US DOD hack on social security number data, um, a lot of that fingerprints. is like extremely inaccurate, but how can a intelligent threat actor utilize the information that was released from that hack to uh, it's, I see you. <laughs> um, to it's like a, so, one one of the one one of the ways that we can do uh, from a security perspective is to stop using knowledge based authentication. Uh, so that that you basically take away the value of that information by stop using it as an authentication source. So we've got yeah, that that's 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 one one way to fight back. Or so, another for, way to fight back is 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 not tying our identity to a ten digit number. Yeah, I mean. From a more practical perspective, I think it's really important for everyone to realize that our data has been exfiltrated, right? Like it's it's out there. And let's remember kids, the internet is forever. So, I mean, I think from a certain perspective, it's not about worrying if your data has been stolen, it's worrying how can you protect yourself. So something that I advise people all the time is freeze your credit record unless you're purchasing something on all three bureaus. Okay, make sure you're signing up after one of the various breaches that you've been a victim of for advanced credit monitoring so you can see what's going on. Um, recently, I had uh, three attempts to create a credit card in my name that wasn't me. Um, and it, so, and I work in this space, right? And so I'm very well aware I got the letters, I got the notice, I called my bank right away. Shout out JP. And I was like, hey, this is totally fraudulent. I didn't apply for this. They're like, okay. And so me, with my expertise, I'm like, hey, can you please send me the application documents so I can file a report with the FBI about them stealing my identity? And the person at Chase goes, we can't do that for data privacy reasons. <laughs> and I go, excuse me, someone's using my social security number, my name, not my address, to try to get a credit card that they were likely going to spend money on that will negatively impact my credit but you're not gonna give me any additional information so I can send it to law enforcement to protect their data privacy. So that's basically a very long winded way of saying you have to protect yourself, okay? And so, you know, there's, there's no safety in numbers anymore, right? We had the Equifax breach. We had just recently the national public data breach, right? Like your social security numbers are out there. Data is really cheap on the dark web. Um, if I had my, my burner laptop, I could literally probably look up all your social security numbers in a couple minutes, right? Like, and I'm not even that techie. <laughs> so you got to protect yourself. There's ways to do it. It might not be perfect, but I mean, that's all you can do. Yeah. One interesting side note to that story is that when that the national data breach, the big one, they looked at the data sets and they realized that if you said, if you did one of those opt out websites that kind of cleared your data and you and you requested your data to be removed by like these delete because, me or privacy yeah doc. those those type of websites it was actually not present and, and so it's weird that you know we've got these evil data brokers are stealing all of our data and doing it but then they followed that law right and and, and right and, and so uh, yeah like that's awesome right so you know so go out there and do that all the delete me you know get do the do you you know i do it like a thanksgiving time when all the family's going crazy i'm like now i'm gonna go hide my computer and do, do, do my delete me sites and you know just one time a year just gonna clean yourself up and so uh there's a um great uh, uh you know report on how well these data removal uh, services work, and uh, it's been done by uh, uh, someone who works for Consumer Reports, Yael Grauer, and uh, she's done a lot of uh, great research on how well 
these work. Uh, and uh, I kind of trust that since I uh, subscribe to delete me, then I my data hasn't uh, been breached in there. But I don't uh, have any illusions that you know, uh, with not perfect. Yeah, 15 yeah. minutes of time, someone couldn't figure it out. I think that it's just a, a element of the fact that we need to have better uh, data, like identity um, identity systems that aren't just some 10 digit number that probably requires some mixture of like digital signatures and uh, th something that you, no. yeah, you know and something that you are um, to actually implement. And that's we, actually gonna... a, we actually had a panel on uh, pass keys earlier mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the FF, and that was on that. And that that's that's what you're you know you're getting to is that we're getting, you know, finally getting to the point where we can trust you know I tie an identity to a device, uh, you know, because we've used phone numbers, and they had the problem with phone numbers is they were never a good authentication mechanism, right? Because it's so easy to do SIM swapping. So that's you know now that we got the uh, uh, TPM chips, we can actually do pass keys, and 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 so I think we're starting to get there technology wise. I'm very you know hopeful in the, in that 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 line of technology. I'm gonna. Yeah. Yeah. So so that you know and yeah we we touch on that you know the the. It's it's a balance between the the range of users and their technical capabilities, the the level of friction that we apply to the outside. So even uh, even having the option of doing that causes the, the large number of customers to be very confused, and 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 that might outweigh the security benefit of that particular control. When we've got uh, other systems to be able to winning. Uh, to be able to not uh, basically to not necessarily use that level of authentication to do the thing that you want to do, right? We have step up level authentication where you might be able to see your uh, see your, uh, your your balances, you know, just by opening up the app. But if you go to trade money, you know, you're going to you know require a fingerprint or or maybe get a you know a a, pu a push or something like that. So you know, it's it's being able to figure out the risk model. And what you know, how what the level of control you need to apply to your, you know, and, and is, is that is that balance? I would like to once again thank the Electronic Frontiers Foundation <laughs> for these very professional, focused computer geniuses. But mostly, I would like to thank to my right. The person that supplied this chaos for our ultimate enjoyment. It is keeping us very alert. And I also want to call you out for not saying what the fucking part number was or where to get it. Blanks, all of you. I think he's getting ready yeah, to show Lint. you. Yeah, it's all, all this debris. Just, it's just all everybody lint. take this what? QR code. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Here you go. Wink, wink, wink. So it's basically go to Amazon and type in either slingshot chicken, catapult toy, funny chicken, toy rubber chicken, slingshot funny stretchy chicken, flingers <laughs> chicken toy activity for children birthday Wait, party. Did, did it? Did an AI write this? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> but just uh, bulk uh, security. Yeah, bulk up. Uh, security chicken. chickens? Did you say sure. security chickens? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So I have a question. You know, one of the things right now you hear, I haven't heard it in the news lately, but uh, TikTok, you know, and you have these security professionals come in online and they're like, oh, yes, you know, they can aggregate, aggregate your data and fill. I'm like, they can already do that with everything that's already out there on the dark web. They ain't, can you give me a way to uh, rephrase this in a simpler term so non-technical simpletons will stop freaking out, you know, with some security engineer that's supposedly an expert that's doing everything that I can literally do myself in Excel? Don't use social media. I mean, because it like when, when when they say that, I'm just like it's just hype. It's they're literally just sensationalizing the TikTok thing is hype to get like you know news. Um, 
like how can uh, g give me ways to paraphrase this for simple ten so they can understand it's like literally I can go to the dark web I can get access to all of your data put in an Excel spreadsheet and like make a whole profile on you without you know TikTok even being there the Chinese have armies of hackers like they don't need TikTok to do this yeah I mean I so I would I would very respectfully disagree with your premise just a little bit and so I spoke on a panel um, earlier today on is the TikTok ban on costume. And the thing is, is that China has persistently accessed the highest levels of our government for years. Okay. Like that is no joke. That is 100% verifiable. They sent a balloon, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, and so the thing is, is from the TikTok perspective, there's two things. One, the algorithm, they could potentially pull a Cambridge Analytica and send, you know, damn, uh, propaganda. <laughs> to you know hundreds of millions of people based upon whatever they want to do but the bigger issue is what data are they aggregating how are they using it right so i think that there's probably a very real and present danger in regards to like what china is doing with TikTok data i believe in my heart of hearts that they're certainly taking that information and using it and so to your question i mean i, I would probably agree with the individual over there that said don't download TikTok. Um, I mean, I don't. I know, but but the thing is, is like I already have Facebook. I, yeah, I, I I kind of appreciate the TikTok discussion because it's something that's actually making people focus on their data privacy, right? Like, yeah, they probably still have an Instagram. They probably still have a Facebook. They're probably on Reddit, who's selling all of your comments to learning language models, right? Like, they're probably still effed, right? Is it past? Is it past midnight yet? I can't. It's barely it. past eleven. Oh damn! Um, you don't have to abbreviate. It's gonna be a long night, guys. We're getting uh, old. But, but the thing is, is what I would, what I personally would do as a, a data privacy advocate is, I would turn that around and say, hey, if you feel this strongly about TikTok, which you probably, I mean, respectfully, don't have a lot of information about. Why don't you take this opportunity to review your data privacy choices? What information are you sharing with other companies? What are, what information are you, you know, are you signing up for a free t-shirt at a con and then giving them your social security number? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like you want to make sure, like, I think you could turn the conversation away from, from you to, okay. I, I, I like the way you position that. Carry yeah. on. So, and just say, Hey, if you're concerned about this, what about the 75 other apps on your phone that are probably taking way more data from you? So can we dive into TikTok just for a hot minute? Like what are, in my mind, it's a far flung thing. It's it's really just hype, but what, you know, from a legal perspective from somebody, you know, who works within the legal space, who is who speaks legalese on a tech level, what, what are the potential ramifications of this? Well, I mean, I think from a constitutional basis or like as far as banning TikTok. Or, yes, both. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there's definitely going to be, there's going to be an in-depth constitutional analysis. Generally, when um, constitutional lawyers or the Supreme Court are looking at something, they want to decide from a First Amendment perspective, freedom of speech, is a restriction content-based or is it content-neutral? Nice. Um, so I think that means you need to drink it. Whoever did that, that's whiskey, I think. Um, but so they're going to have to determine is a ban on TikTok content neutral or is it content based? Now, I would argue that it is content neutral, thereby meaning that it doesn't rise to the highest levels of scrutiny needed by the courts. And so as long as the government shows at the very least, a, you know, a uh, a rational interest in you know national security i think you know the TikTok ban might be upheld esquire i've got a uh i got a warm nos energy if you need it i know it's still early so uh being that it's hacking 201 i just wanted to ask if someone's got like a foundation they've got the 101 of hacking what is the next thing you recommend to keep your skills sharp to keep current if you're not yet in the field what are your top recommendations i think well <laughs> one of the ones answers that i would give is uh, to to kind of uh, look up uh, current capture the flag contests and sign up for them and just kind of see what's out there and um and try to try to participate in those because that will well as a red teamer kind of keep your skills up to par um there's a lot of great resources out there 
um, for learning, you know, memory safe languages. If you're a programmer, uh, if you are a, um, you know, defender, then 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 there's a, you know, a, a, a slew of resources out there too um, that you can kind of um, find. And I think that was usually kind of like a, a no search press is a good uh, way to find a lot of the. Uh, the defender kind of uh, resources out there and uh, OS. Uh, there's a, a also um, you know uh, the uh, um, what language like programming language would you guys recommend to learn to like be better at hacking for for hacking for like offensive or what? Yeah, yeah. Shell uh, also. I mean Ruby if you're doing Metasploit. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, I was gonna say Python is also very good. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, Power PowerShell. If if you if you want to get into just your know, programming in general, uh, uh, Python's great because then you can quickly extend into the huge library of Python based tools uh, in the security world, and just and you'll and and it's you're no longer you know, you kind of upgrade from script gritty to script gritty plus, right? You now know what what the script is doing, and then you can take it and use it for your own, and and, and then you're you really feel like now you're actually you know hacking. The person who asked the question, are you local to the Atlanta area? Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're not already, um, get in touch with the DC 404 and the Atlanta Linux enthusiast groups and um, check out Keith Watson's webpage. He was a big InfoSec guy at Georgia Tech, and he and Georgia Tech developed and are still developing. He's retired now, but Georgia Tech keeps developing open source uh, capture the flag uh, stuff, and I believe both DEF CON 404 and um, the Atlanta Linux enthusiasts deploy that regularly, use it uh, with each other and their groups and get involved with that, learn how to run it yourself. Yep. And yeah, that web security, a wasp, you know. Yeah, and, and just basically, you, you know, reach out to your community. You know, think about the way that you like to connect to people, right? There's discords. You know, we were on Mastodon, right? There's still probably, you know, to InfoSec Twitter, you know, it, and, and, you know, meetups. Right. There's lots of meetups, you know, like I said, in the Atlanta area, we've got tons. And so if you're, you know, not in the metro area, just, you know, look out and reach out to wherever your folks are, because there's a lot of us out there. And, and you know, being able to kind of connect with folks kind of keeps us on our toes. And really, you know, when you, re you really want to know where to go next, you're kind of stuck somewhere. You can hear what other people are going through and say, hey, I'd like to go that way. Cool. So it's just a great to, to be get connected and be part of the community. Reach out locally and regionally, make new friends and uh, have fun hacking each other's shit. Exactly. Don't underestimate long form books too. They can you know, bring you on a journey of knowledge and that has been really meticulously prepared. So I'm glad somebody else likes the big books. I still like them. <laughs> yep. Yeah, saying, yeah, I was gonna say uh just get on the mic. Yeah, he was mentioning Humble Bumble. Like often very often has very good security packages. <laughs> and real quick, if you would, there is a good site to look at uh, cybersecurity news and things that have happened. It's called bleepingcomputer.com. So you can see what's out there and what's actually happening. I, I've had to say uh, bleepingcomputer.com, like, you know, board meeting level. And that's just we a weird phrase to say when you're in a suit. <laughs> I was like Zach Whitaker, who does TechCrunch, uh, he prepares a weekly newsletter, which is all about um, cybersecurity and breaches. Uh, and um, there's also uh, Metacurity, which is a daily newsletter, if you have enough time for that. I don't usually, but um, Metacurity is great for just really up to the minute updates for cybersecurity news. To change the topic just a little bit, go ahead. To go back to a local situation. On Friday, Georgia Tech was uh, cited by the Department of Justice in the first of the cyber crime initiative situation, where the DOJ actually took over the contract, took over the complaint. Yeah, and, and just to, just to correct you real quick, it's the Georgia Tech Research Center, GTRC, which is slightly different. GTRC group. and GTRC. Georgia Tech. Uh, Obviously, um, we're both uh, cited in yeah. the complaint. I believe it was the uh, board of directors. So 
in that particular case, Georgia Tech had gone through uh, over $160 million worth of contracts, over uh, 100 issues. They had claimed to file, they claimed to file uh, NST or DFARS 252.204712 contract documents covering 110 requirements of NST 800-171, and they didn't do it. They lied about what they did. They lied about the organization of their networks. They claimed that the uh, scores that they were laying out, which was 96, which is ridiculously high, was based on a virtual network based in uh, for Georgia Tech for the entire organization, which does not exist. So this is uh, getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar up to the elbow. Uh, is it, and right now, based on the HHS Hall of Shame, about 65% of breaches are social engineering. They got nothing to do with software. Somebody did something they weren't ever told not to do, and somebody ran off with their data. So while hacking and electronic is lots of fun, that's not where most of the breaches are coming from. And you've got organizations like Georgia Tech, who is world-renowned, lying about their cybersecurity, lying egregiously, and claiming things they do not do. How do you see this affecting the industry? Thank you. So I, I will agree that like the vast majority of, of data breaches are a result of quasi social engineering, quasi social engineering. We've found that like 55% of all cyber claims that we're seeing across the marketplace are a result of email phishing. Okay. And that includes ransomware. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a real present danger. And, and also like the classic one that comes to mind is like MGM, right? Where they basically hacked a multinational casino conglomerate by calling up the help desk. So it, it is a big danger. And I think, you know, that's why companies are focusing a lot on employee education. Um, one of my favorite, like, infosec comics is uh it's there's a boxing ring maybe you guys have seen it and in one side there's like all this equipment and hardware and there's people working on it and on the other side it's just a, a dorky looking dude with like boxing gloves right and it's like who's gonna win right and i think at the end of the day no matter how technologically advanced we are there's always going to be a human component to the business right there's always going to be a human component whether it's in academia, private corporations, or government. So you really need to plan for an issue with your lowest common denominator, which for the longest time was technology, but now it's kind of that, that human element. So I, I think that's a very Im important consideration. Um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar enough with the Georgia Tech incident to, to really comment on that part of it, but thank you for your question. Yeah, if it happened Friday, we been here since then and yeah. Drunks. yeah 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 i'm sure he'll be waiting for us to when we return to work um does anybody yeah, have any comments or insights they'd like to share on the telegram situation uh, well, I, I mean if you like you know people that you know allow wars to happen um but yeah i mean i, I think from a legal perspective it's certainly very interesting just because um Apparently, uh, the French government found out because the woman he was with was posting on Instagram where they were going and the hotels they were staying at and every time they landed at an airport. Um, but, I mean, certainly France was in its right to, um, you know, arrest him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the founder of Telegram was arrested in France a week ago. Um, well, I mean... I mean, depending upon your views on the Ukrainian conflict, it might be warranted um, just because I know Russia as a state organization uses Telegram primarily as a communication app in their war against Ukraine, um, as well as Telegram is really has taken zero action to stop crime, sexual trafficking, um, you know, war planning um, and things similar to that. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting if, you know, if they still have all the receipts on their servers, if they actually delete things the way that they said they would, 
And if there's going to be a potential plea deal, you know, by exchanging some of that information to get this guy out of hock. Yeah, I think that like, a, you know, in terms of the Telegram situation, um, if uh, he doesn't want to be worried about the charges that's being levied against him, then maybe Telegram should have implemented end-to-end -end security uh, by default on their conversations like they very much proclaimed in their marketing material that they had done. Yeah, so don't trust apps that uh, um, have very uh, elusive claims to their security and uh, can't back it up with facts. How about just don't trust apps? <laughs> hey. <laughs> what about it? Well, so I mean, it's interesting. He's also though, in a supermax. So, yeah, I mean, you know, so it's kind of, this is a little bit of a non, not quite a non sequitur, but so when I'm dealing with like very large scale ransomware events with some very large companies, um, it actually is a little bit of a point of contention when I tell them they need to go analog and basically say, hey, we need to take this to offline comms. If you have any questions, communicate via telephone, via a trusted number. Um, you can't communicate during your business, you know, email, things like that. And the amount of pushback that I get is, is pretty extreme, um, even though I've had some instances where um, we've been doing comms with work email because it was warranted that the email you know system was clean. And then the threat actor will respond from an actual email account on prem saying, hey, thank you for disclosing the, the insurance policy. Our ransom demand is now X. Um, so. <laughs> I have a pet theory that as the technological threats get more advanced, we're actually going to move towards more of an analog thing like a la Dune, right? We're like, hey, we have this shield that protects us from all kinds of like projectile weapons. So now we have to do swords that have to be below a certain acceleration level. I kind of feel like that's going to happen, right? Like you're going to have in-person verification for wire transfers or, you know, contacting people on the phone but even then you can deep fake voices and conversations one of the now. reasons hamas was able to successfully launch against israel israel as we know accounts for 40 percent of global cybersecurity sales they are the leader in global cybersecurity and espionage Sorry. capabilities hamas adopted offline typewriter like communications to create a digital black hole that israel was not able to infiltrate that is how they were able to kick off that attack and you know when israel was doing the blackouts why did they do that because they were bottlenecking their offline analog communications and you know when they cut the power they would have to use radio comms that is actually because i actually gave a full report on this um but no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. It, it's a terrible example, you know, of how they use that technology. Right. But going offline like that, typewriter-like communications, Russia did it 15 years ago. Um, that's why we can't infiltrate certain areas of the Kremlin. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and I think that, I mean, again, it's my personal conjecture, but, um, you know, as things get more advanced, I think we're going to have a little bit of a regression towards, like, what it was like, you know, pre-internet. Yeah, it was uh, 2009 when the Russian Ministry of Defense actually purchased, I think it was some 30,000 typewriters because they were taking strategic military decisions and communications offline and going pen and paper. Pen and paper comes only. Sorry. Uh, I also think, like, you know, there's a possibility of dedicated devices which aren't uh, you know, necessarily just completely offline that have a very purpose built design to provide some security measure like you have with uh say yubikey or uh you know a, a nano key or one of these type of devices and you don't have to go full primitivist in order to have some very specific uh guarantees hey maybe every single device that we carry shouldn't have every single sensor that you know that 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 is humanly possible uh temperature camera microphone etc uh, maybe we should have devices that are purpose built to provide some security measures and i think that that is uh one of the solutions right one of the kind of uh, uh many many uh solutions that that come uh you know that 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 uh that that you know um steer clear of a, a completely non-technological -tech one 
So I just wanted to uh, backtrack, you know, what you were saying uh, with TikTok. We now know that the federal government has fully banned Kapersky in the United States. Can you give us any parallel, you know, what precedents that may have set with, you know, how, what, what action, you know, from a legalese perspective, what, what are the implications for that? Yeah, I believe they banned it for governmental based um, entities as well. As now, yeah, now it's contractors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it a full ban now? So I, I think I, I'd read that that was going to happen. I mean, Kaspers Kaspersky's been um, like I think it's been known in the infosec community for quite a long time that that they were sus. So I'm really not surprised by it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really not surprised by it. What, what's surprising to me is I've actually had some policyholders that use that as their primary like AV and like EDR solution, if you can call it EDR. And they're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? We need to change this out. And it's like, yeah, it's like literally Russian plants stealing your information. Why are you using this in the first place? But again, it goes to, I mean, I think the question in regards to the, the legal ability of a, the United States government to restrict them is going to be a much stronger argument than in the TikTok space, because there is an argument for TikTok that it is content creation. Right. And so it goes back to that initial analysis of are you making a law under the First Amendment that is content neutral saying, hey, because Kapersky can't operate in the US, it's not about content, right? Like they're a, a cybersecurity firm, right? And so because of that, the, the ability of the US government to restrict them is much stronger and much less likely to be challenged. An example of this is eight years ago or thereabouts. A London branch of a, I believe it was Mitsui Bank, had some, uh, they hired a new uh, maintenance crew who came in and put little dongles on all the backs of all their computers. So then they had uh, a case where they had a $10 million wire transfer, or 10 million pound, pardon me, wire transfer that would have gone through. They had all the right codes except for one thing. At that level, it required a personal signature from a visible board member. <laughs> if they had gone for $5 billion, they it would have gone through. A personal yeah, so, signature, what? Can you repeat that? A personal signature from what? To issue the, the wire pay payment. To issue the wire payment. So, like, let me tell you a funny story. And, and it's funny because if, if I don't laugh, I cry. So, <laughs> I, I had a claim once where um, it was a small professional services firm. And um, they, for some reason, decided to put the entirety of their staff on their website, which included their bookkeeper slash controller, their CEO, whatnot. And so the controller got an email one day um, from their CEO, or at least it looked like their CEO, that said, hey, please process a wire transfer payment to this address, blah, blah, blah. This is an emergency. You need to do this. And um, when you look at the email communication in Outlook, just by opening up the email, it shows like the whole address. Well, it had the CEO's name, but the actual email address was officepresident2016 at gmail.com. Okay. And so the, <laughs> the, the controller like is talking to this person that they think is the CEO and um, Google actually, I think like caught that this was like a spammer email. And so during the conversation it actually changed to officepresident2017 at gmail.com. Well, get this, the book, the controller actually goes, goes down the hall, knocks on the CEO's door and says, Hey, do you want me to send this wire transfer out? And the CEO looks up and says, yeah, send it. Okay. Uh, I think it was $135,000. Okay. Which in, in my work is not a lot. Uh, it was a lot to them, but, um, so anyways, literally two weeks later, the CEO, literally, this isn't a joke or hyperbole wakes up in the middle of the night was like what time is it what effing wire transfer <laughs> and freaks out and they come to find out that that this was a, a social engineering scam that resulted in this so you know that's just a little story a little horror story to say that even when you go analog even then when you have the proper procedures in place people can still make mistakes but certainly if the CEO was thinking a little bit more in the present, then this money never would have went out. 12.30. <laughs> Is it? 
No. It's 1130. The pizza should be getting picked up in a little bit, and uh, we break for pizza when it gets here. Was there a, is there a pizza fund to contribute to? It's a. It's already been maxed out. Yes, sir. So, so with your criticism of Russia, it's almost as if you don't get all your news from RT or Sputnik. <laughs> What's with that? Or Fox News, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> so another question actually we talk about taking things offline sometimes for security reasons i think a lot of people forget about the role of radio and the fact that crypto in radio is still evolving radio security is still evolving and i know a little bit about of it about it from like a government military perspective but what are you seeing on the civilian side when it comes to radio security mm. Is it something that you run into on your, in your during the course of your jobs? Um, I think radio security is a, a huge thing when it comes to uh, the obscurity by which police departments are able to communicate with each other by like P25 systems rather than clear text systems uh, communicating with each other. And so that uh, has resulted in a great degree of the uh, of, of obscurity when it comes to them communicating with each other and us not being able to audit what they're doing. Um, P25 is some level of encryption that requires a key and that you're able to then with the key monitor, but um, it is uh, a, it is, it has injured the ability for civilians to, to um, you know, initiate uh, uh, some level of oversight. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> on the corporate side, it's it's a uh, it's interesting. The it's a it's like a level of abstraction. We're seeing the products of the telecommunications company using these technologies to put you know basically a layer of abstraction, kind of like kinda, you know we're talking cloud services, and what they're doing is is you know over obviously over radio, and that's how they're providing. And so that layer of of abstraction is kind of like a uh, you know. Talking about you know energy production versus you know distribution versus you know all those layers in in that industry, you know from a corporate side we're you know a, a, a touch behind to get to that level. You guys have a SCADA story from the last year or two that we may not have heard of. It's the big expensive industrial thing that seems to fuck everybody, mess everybody up, but uh, you don't necessarily hear a lot about. Particular interest or yeah, we've we've had a lot of um, operational technology breaches over the past year. It's actually something that um, <laughs> threat actor groups are are hiring for. Uh, if you go on some of the Russian based dark web like hacker forums, they're specifically looking for engineers that can deal with SCADA systems. Just because when you think about it from a ransomware perspective, if you can stop production. <laughs> then that gives the most leverage and and wants to force a payment. Yeah, yeah. See, sees the means of production, and if you can do it electronically, right? Then, you know, I mean, especially when you're seeing some of these larger scale breaches, where if you have a company that has a two billion dollar a year revenue and they're down for two weeks, what are those damages, right? And a lot of times, those damages can't be recoverable, even if they get back up and running. So I think we've seen a huge increase in SCADA related issues. Um, and this is complicated by the fact that a lot of the typical DFIR and restoration services, they don't have SCADA, SCADA experience. So it, it's really like you have to find specialized vendors. You have to get them on site in most cases. Um, typical DFIR, you can you know remote in. Um, and same for restoration, because you can just log in a domain controller and do a lot of stuff. For SCADA, you can't, you have to be on site. So we're seeing an increase of it. We're seeing an increased cost of remediating it. And then also an increase in ransomware payments because if you're pwned, there's not a lot you can do except get access back. I'd say it's across the board. Um, we've seen a massive uptick in the aggressiveness of ransomware threat actors. Um, I think probably in my opinion, a result of law enforcement kind of being a little bit more aggressive with a takedown of like Lockbit and other entities. Um, so, you know, for instance, the Lockbit guy who's now on the SDN sanction list, 
Um, at one point, Lockbit said that they wouldn't attack healthcare facilities and other things. And now that individual has rescinded that and said, my goal in my life is to ransom a million companies. Um, so they're getting more aggressive. And so it, it's, you know, it's happy hunting for them. They don't really care anymore what industry vertical you're in. But there are some threat actor variants that do specialize in specific industry verticals because they have that technical knowledge to kind of get access to their systems and network. Oh God. <laughs> you missed. Worth a, worth a try. So, sorry. Can I ask a quick question about, um, so moving to the future a little bit, from the Office of Security standpoint, um, with quantum computing, with the potential with the quantum computing. Not aiming at you, I'm going for the camera. Okay. So um, with quantum computing, it, there's a possibility that the encryption as we know it can be hacked, right? Or it can be cracked. So like the Shor's algorithm, the mathematics behind it Sorry. would actually crack all encryption as we know it. So from an offensive security perspective, uh, from an offensive security perspective, what are you guys doing to prepare for that? So he was asking about quantum comp computing and how it might impact in encryption. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. There there are you know basic there are quantum safe encryption you know we uh, encryption formulas now that we're, we're you know that are out there and and that's developing. Right, and so it's not that you know the encryption, you know that the you know, quantum will break it all, uh, but quantum will break a whole lot of stuff that we haven't been able to break efficiently so far. And so the risk model really is because I think by the time we get to a you know quantum capable situation like that, we will have replaced the vast majority of the encryption modules that we're doing. We're already doing that, right? It's 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 underway. So I think. I, that's that's the threat model, right? So it, now you got to think about the, the the data that's already been transmitted that has been stored in like a Utah facility or somewhere else, right? That has not been been able to be encrypted yet. So things like you know, you know we talk about Telegram and other types of encrypted channels that might be sitting in in a in a data storage somewhere, and so that is the real impact. So you've got to think about what is you know been already encrypted that they're just waiting to unlock it's a time capsule of chaos um, just a follow-up question on that so the 256 sha can can theoretically quantum computing can crack that or no it can so, it can crack it and, so and, and that, that's okay the that, highest... that's that's not um it, it can it, it brute force attacks against using short algorithm can Reduce the complexity of a uh, of brute force attack uh, by the uh, square root of of it. so so basically like anything that is a uh, two, like a, a two fifty six block cipher will be reduced to a one twenty eight bit block cipher. Um, so that means that we should all be using better block ciphers, um, uh, and the best. Um, I mean that's that's an incredible breakthrough in the efficiency of breaking uh, breaking uh, algorithm uh, by brute force attacks. Um, I do not want to diminish that, but I don't think it'll break encryption as we know it. I think that it'll it'll make it way easier to do brute force attacks. Um, and we need to we need to. <laughs> Make sure that we have block ciphers that are resistant to that. Yeah, I, I mean, something I think is going to look very closely at will be the cryptocurrency space, right? Because we have a pretty good capitalistic market-based reason to secure quantum-proof encryption. Um, and I know that the Bitcoin.org and, and other kind of players in that space are trying to um, put that onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And, and so... Um, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. But at the end of the day, you still need a quantum computer to do this. Um, and I mean, we're still pretty far away from it, even with some of the theoretical kind of things that they're working on. I got my eye on you, Quarks.
And, Thank you. I, and I what, appreciate and that one laugh. <laughs> and, and while Quantum is, is not out there breaking encryption, it is available as a service. You can go to Amazon and IBM nice. and a couple of other cloud services and pay to do, to do put stuff on Quantum. So if you are a lot smarter than I am and know how to do that, just let you know that that, that service is available. Is it? And I will is that have my AI write AF? my Quantum processor how about that it chat gpt yes chat gpt hack bitcoin go i i tried to uh i asked hack for my gibson really recently i asked we'll have the, gold uh, plated thingies next year okay like whether a well-known uh whether a well-known uh prime like a large prime number was prime and chat gpt said no it's not prime it was prime it's it's kind of yeah, it's, it can't even do like how many r's are in you know like this you know big word i mean it, it's it's ridiculous it is it, it there's a very very good ways of, of reminding people that it's not a knowledge-based system right it's a, it's a language creation model thing. glorify it autocomplete exactly and then yeah. you, you know but there are good use cases for it. i've got you know kids on the spectrum and neurodiverse folks that aren't the best at writing you know written communication you know i've it, and but you know being able to have those assistive technologies is, is great to be able to for me it was always the summary paragraph i could never like you know you know get you know get that right you know, and stuff like that to be able to get them through school. I think there's going to be, uh, uh, once we start to embrace it, to realize that there are some pretty good use cases. It's just not going to change the world in the way that they think it. I mean, all it is itself is pretty good. <laughs> like, I'm not there just was, saying that. There was a really good um, AI in under an hour <laughs> panel earlier this weekend. Um, but can you guys, like, <laughs> crunch it to, like, 60 seconds? Do it? What is AI? What what does ChatGPT so, do? Yeah, okay. yeah, like yeah, I got you. I got you. All right. So, so we've been taught. You probably heard AI in technology for quite a while. And in about it was about about two years ago, about a year and a half or so ago, is when it really got crazy. And what what the biggest difference is is you know is that it, it you know, on the base is the same kind of underlying technology. It's neural you know and linguistic and, and or math vector math to be able to then you know, apply that to uh, you know, the way language works. So you mathematically look at the way that all the patterns of words go together and you can learn how to mimic the language and, and be able to have some type of you know, uh, uh, impact analysis on what is the most likely uh, phrase in this particular based on scenario. based on statistical uh, uh based on statistical statistical uh, uh probability models and, yeah. and not just language but like you know for instance art you know and, and other kind of things yeah image video audio it's, it's yeah. it, it, the, the, that has been the really interesting application because i like i can conceptualize the little you know vectors and the, the words and everything but like that you know when there you start talking about the analyzing uh, uh audio and video is is really amazing it's like like do so, like draw steve buscemi in cubism artwork it's really good at that it's really good at basically like using former like models that uh to do something that is that a draw a new <laughs> like formulate some new form of artwork it cannot do because it it is it, it is not isn't it, there isn't anything inherently creative about it there's nothing creative you know there's nothing creative about these models it's it's predictive and and based on what has formerly been done god damn this is fucking distracting <laughs> He's starting to crack. <laughs> you're, you're talking about like one word a chicken. Let's go ahead and just stop blaming the chicken. No, 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 no. It's fine. No. I need to hear about this break anyway. Hacking 201. The tradition has been started. Okay. There's no, <laughs> there's no putting the chicken back in the bag. Okay. This is a. Real simple yes no question related to what you just said. Is this language model being accessed for like uh, chat platforms and stuff like that? Because instead of just 
changing the spelling of words or trying to guess is actually changing whole words and sentence structures. Um, is there any way to opt out of that? I don't find any settings for that. What accent do you have, good man? Speech impediment. What? I was born with a speech impediment. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you? Sorry, I thought you. I thought it was Australian. Um, can you repeat that, please? So yeah. Okay. More specifically, in uh, Google Hangouts or like chat, um, it used to just try to fix the spelling of the words I'd use, and now it's actually completely changing the words and order of the words in my messages, in, like private communication. And I is a way to opt out of this kind of functionality. I think that's dependent upon like the service you're using. Um, I will say that there's been a lot of, um, there's, there's case law, or not case law, there's a statute in California called um, the California Invasion of Privacy Act. And so we're seeing a lot of litigation arising out of the use of this type of service in chatbots and things because it's recording your information and then using it for whatever reason, right? So I would, I mean, I hate to say this, but look in your EULA right and and see if if there's anything to do um and see if you can app out typically of like personalized responses yeah yeah that's upsetting for sure All right, i'm gonna step out for a moment friendly fire <laughs> I just want to say I can't wait till they upload this video later in the year. <laughs> this whole panel's chicken. Are, are there any questions? Just out of curiosity. So many questions. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a question. I imagine you've all seen a lot of cases that make you go like this about eat, company eat security. Mic. I imagine you've all seen a lot of situations that make you bang your head about company security, but which one was like the bangiest of the most? Ooh, ooh let me go first. I have so many, but the one that sticks out the most is um, I used to work for a company that did kind of proprietary outside in scanning for all of our policyholders. And one of the things they would look for would be like RDP or like open C panel or you know, VPN without MFA. And we had this one uh, policyholder where I got a claim in and it was a pretty bad ransomware incident. They were completely pwned, backups encrypted, everything's com just completely messed up. And I look at their kind of profile on our internal systems to see that we notified them six times about RDP on port 3830. And so I get on the phone with them and I'm talking to their, their CISO, I'm like, hey, is your name so and so? Yes. Hey, we've sent you six emails about this RDP that's open. It's likely this is how you got hacked, considering you could just go on Shodan and, and figure out that you had open access into your network. And they're like, yeah, we got those emails. I'm like, well, why didn't you close down this RDP access? And the person, I shit you not, goes, our CEO didn't want to memorize another password, so we kept it open for him. Accepted. Yeah, so they were down for like three weeks and had a pretty large uninsured loss. So, but so, the CEO could be lazy. So on the flip side, what was the most sorry? On the flip side, what was the most ingenious hack recent? Oh man, I would I would honestly say the recent one I talked earlier about the wire transfer fraud where they had three different individuals using uh, deep fakes live because they they deep fake like the video was live to verify the transaction. I would say that was pretty wild. Like it was literally on a Teams call that they somehow were projecting uh, three deep fakes. Three? Three, three different individual employees to verify this $5 million wire. And then another one too, kind of similar. Um, it wasn't quite a deep fake, but um, they wanted voice verification via Zoom. And so the threat actor who we determined was probably from Nigeria somehow found an Australian to jump on the call because the individual who needed to voice verify was Australian and they found someone within five minutes to do so. Yeah, so I, I think this was probably a legitimate individual, um, but I mean, I guess it very well. This was this was a couple years ago. So this was before. I mean, maybe there was some underground deep fake stuff that 
um, they were leveraging, but they literally like, hey, we need to verify this. Sorry, we need we need to have a call within 10 minutes. And they're like, all right, no problem. And five minutes later, they were speaking on Zoom on camera with someone who verified it. Yeah, was, one of the ones I, I like is is the stories of of the, the sim swappers that go in and uh, you know physically like the you know the what the what their goal is is to get access to you know T Mobile or or one of the mobile website mobile carriers the ability to you know do the sim swapping themselves right so it's either an insider which you know we can all comprehend insider threats but this one just blows my mind that they kind of have like this like you know, like motorcycle gang mentality. They have, they, you know, this crew that rolls up in a van, they roll into a, you know, T-Mobile store, they run in, they grab the manager's tablet, they run out and jump in their van, and then they see how many SIM swaps they can do before, you know, the manager runs back and calls IT and shuts down that tablet. It is just amazing that that is the level of, energy being put into you know sim swapping and how much money people can make and the, the kind of motivations that get people to do things to to what extent uh you know that type of level of of uh you know activity yeah there's a kind of interesting synthesis between uh cyber crime and street crime which we're seeing that involves a greater level of sophistication than we previously seen and i think that kind of uh speaks to i guess um you know uh some of the alliances that are being formed between uh, like a run-of-the-mill kind of uh theft gangs and you know uh some of the more advanced attacks <laughs> that we might not kind of pre so I, I have a million of these. I should probably just do a talk on on this. Like, <laughs> um, but another really funny anecdote is we were actively negotiating a ransomware payment. Um, our our client was completely pwned, mission critical data encrypted, no backups, and we we're having a, a pretty productive conversation when the threat actor goes, um, "I just want to let you know that I'm leaving on PTO, um, so I'm going to transfer you to my colleague." Um, who's well aware of your situation is more than happy to assist you, uh, but I'll, I'll be on I'll be on PTO for the next week. So thank you. It was it's been a pleasure working with you. I'm gonna jump in. Give us a new plot for a next hackers movie. What would you want to see? Oh man! So do you guys don't steal this idea, or at least give me credit and lots of royalties? But I want to do like an office like sitcom based upon a ransomware group where like you walk into like just this normal building in Russia and there's this like grandmother like working reception. Yeah. And then she's like sitting there like threatening people with murdering their children if they don't pay like a hundred Bitcoin ransom. It, 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 Who here has seen Easy Riders? Easy Riders. Yeah, that's a great motorcycle movie. And I think feel like um. A motorcycle movie that involves hackers that uh, bring their laptops with them in order to hack around the globe on their bikes. Be fucking badass. I don't know. <laughs> well, what's really, it, really interesting with uh, Russia and the hiking, hacking culture is that there's this interesting comparison to American you know, rap culture and how that's kind of, you know, a, a part of a part of a, uh, a music and a theme <laughs> Uh, to a you know group of people, oh, and that is that is more established in Russia. The hacking scene is is to that level that the people would think of the gang scene in 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 America. So it, 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 that just kind of, you can, can kind of conceptualize that. That's why we have so many you know uh, very talented people you know being scooped up by that that regime. Yeah, you're, I don't know if anyone here. Thing. Oh, no, it, it, uh, a hacker sequel. It's going to be Hollywood bullshit. And they're going to hack the quantum Gibson this time. So, if if you ever want some interesting reading and try try to understand like the mental paradigm of like these Eastern European hackers, look into Gopnik culture. If you're familiar with Russia at all, so it's essentially yeah, he's got the Gopnik squat. Um, but essentially, there's this huge culture that's very popular there of criminality. Okay, and it, it's literally a lot of young young men and even young women. They end up in jail, um, and they it's it's kind of similar to like rap culture, but it's kind of accepted, and it's something that people are literally proud of. They're proud of being criminals, and they're proud of of taking advantage of others, right? Yeah, I, 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 I
Yeah. Yep. Hundred percent. And and so, but it's an interesting thing of like, well, how can they do this? Because they really, they're really proud of it. And you know, I've seen a lot where these threat actor groups, not so much recently because they've just got more aggressive, but for the longest time, they would actually like present themselves as security researchers to say, oh, well, we found this bug on your system. We can help you fix it. And if you paid the ransom, they would actually give you a full after act report with a detailed like advice of, hey, this is how we got in. This is what you can do to fix it. And oh, by the way, we're going to add you to our whitelist so that no one attacks you that we're affiliated with. Yeah, I've, I've seen them. I've seen those ARs. I mean, it, it is exactly they, they give you like a, a like the script, a script log of exactly the commands that they ran. I mean, it's it's like it's beautiful to be able to learn from, and and it's just rich knowledge yeah. to be able to hand back. <laughs> I just, I mean, it's it's crazy. That'd be insane. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, like, what's the the monthly average wage in Russia? Hundred thousand dollars. It's, it's it's like it's like it's like one tenth of that. It's like yeah, no, it, it's it's actually way less than that. It's actually a couple hundred dollars a month. And so these ransomware threat actor groups, they're not like there's no profit sharing typically, but they'll pay these lower level people like a couple thousand dollars a week. Okay, and they and apparently some at PTO. Well, I mean, if you guys, yeah, I mean, I would literally encourage everyone to read the Conti leaks. If you're familiar, Conti was a fairly large uh, ransomware threat actor group. They're primarily known for being one of the first really aggressive ones that actually exfiltrated data instead of just encrypting and ransoming for that. Um, and they also were one of the progenitors of ransomware as a service. Um, when the Ukrainian conflict started, Conti actually like hemorrhaged um, because half of them were Ukrainian and half of them were Russian. Um, but uh, a security researcher somehow had access to all of Conti's like chats and everything and decided to leak it. Uh, I love it because he's a security researcher instead of a member of Conti. Um, but they've all been translated and you can read them. And so the conversations that they have are absolutely wild. Talking about vacations, talking about oh. doctor appointments, talking about, oh, I'm going to be out of the office. Can you take over my shift? Okay. Um, also being like, <laughs> also being okay. like, hey, this week is U.S. Healthcare Week, so we're going to try to hit as many U.S. healthcare companies as we can. Can I? I mean, it wouldn't be hard to have better uh, vacation leave than the U.S. To be honest, <laughs> like, come on. Well, there's this great comparison to like you know, in, in, in fantasy, there's always the, the the pirate nation, right? We've got we've got our own pirate nation over there. You know, just that that's the the culture. It's part of the, it's part of it. it's great. Mm. I was actually going to ask if I could get hit by the cattle prod before we went to midnight. Uh, when he gets back, he'll be back in a minute. Oh, right on. Yeah, I mean, I guess as long as you're not messing with computers that have Russian keyboards installed, what's the issue? Yeah, no, I mean, so for you that don't know, a lot of the ransomware as a service malware, if the base language of the computer is Cyrillic, um, they won't encrypt. They have like a non-encrypting like process. So they're primarily looking at non-Cyrillic based languages to, 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 to mess with. An old colleague of mine, Mona Wang, uh, has done a great uh, analysis of Chinese uh, based keyword system predictive. And a, a lot of those are using what she calls encryption. Uh, and that is, um, you know, not using SSL, not using HTTPS, not using well-established standards for encryption. And these keyboards that are used by hundreds of millions of Chinese uh, citizens and expats uh, are using kind of just homegrown, hey, this looks good kind of encryption. Yeah, and that's, um, that's uh, like the standard for the large Android keyboard uh, and iOS keyboard, uh, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, encryption. It's it, 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 it is encryption is one you don't roll your own. Yeah. Never roll your own encryption. As soon as the pizza's here, we'll go ahead and break. I mean, we uh, we can keep the. Don't shoot a chicken on my pizza. Yeah. There is so much wrong with what you just said. <laughs> 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 
So, so uh, are we are we talking armistice? Is that is that what? The, uh, I mean, we've got the uh, Dennis Rodman looking guy with Simon Crowell behind him, I guess. 